Right, uh, good afternoon ladies and gentlemen and welcome to another uh, episode of the Learnaholic Pen. Today uh, it's my honor to have Peter Hurst again on the board and we have a special guest, uh, Mr. Abdullah, who is uh, responsible for the e-learning uh, uh, at Shanos University of Technology and Applied Sciences. Welcome both of you. Do you like to have a short greeting with the audience? Uh, hi everyone. And hello again. Thanks very much for having us. Thank you for accepting actually the, the invitation. So uh, today, as we talked about it before, we're going to talk about the e-learning and perhaps the advantages and disadvantages of e-learning, which is my concern. So let's, let's talk about Moodle first, I think. I, as far as I remember, like we have Moodle in Oman for a long time. Yeah. I'm not sure if there is any type of... Is that free version? Do we have any version that we need to pay money or not? Uh, it's actually paid. It's, a, it's an annual subscription that uh, we renew every year. Um, and um, it, it actually started... Um, we started using Moodle here in the English Language Center um, about four or five years ago. There was an initiative from the Dean to use Moodle. Uh, to help the students who are not at uh, who, who are standing uh, who are again starting in the second semester um, and they are staying at home for maybe three four months so the dean wanted us to create courses for them uh, to uh, help them use the the courses but um, I have seen somewhere I have seen a type of uh a type of uh, Moodle which is in another color it's like I come I think it comes with the green one or the brown one and I call it the Moodle plugin is that something different I think it has extra features but you need to pay money is that different have you ever heard of it Moodle um, plugin well a plugin is basically something that you can plug into another application mm -hmm. so I mean it depends on which application they're using as their um, learning management system that would be my understanding of it um, when it comes to the different colors I know that there are different versions of Moodle so um, we're using I can't remember which version it is but it's three point something so. yeah um, so it's been upgraded relatively recently um, but that side of it is taken care of um, taken care of by the Educational Technology Centre. Um, Abdullah and I in the e-learning committee, we are more to do with onboarding students, so enrolling students in various courses um, and also um, planning the, the structure of courses um, online, um, checking various different types of resources that we can use um, and basically managing the, the learning management um, system for the English Language Centre. Yeah, a, a plugin is like, uh, for example, we are using Turnitin within exactly, yeah, Moodle. Yeah. I remember uh, since because I came 2015 to Oman, there was Moodle. So mm -hmm. in some universities, they, they implemented Moodle for placement tests, for the purpose of placement tests, but not online one. So you had the, the lab and then the students will go behind the computer and do some placement tests by the computer. But I think it became f suddenly, I mean, famous during coronavirus. Uh, well, I, as I was saying, it, we didn't actually use it until maybe four years ago when the dean wanted us to create courses for the for students at home. And uh, then um, I came with the idea of uh, using it as a, a self-study um, platform for the, for the students who are studying in campus. So uh, I proposed for the e-learning committee and uh, uh, we started then creating courses and uploading materials. Um, we used it a lot more during COVID, but even before that uh, we had a course every semester for all the students in foundation. Um, the practice of using Moodle for the placement test is still used until last year. and. Um, um, it has been going on forever, I guess, since I joined college. In I also joined in, in uh, 2016, by the way. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So um, it's uh, still going on, but this year uh, it was a little bit different, the placement tests. I don't know why. It was paper-based. But before that, we have been uh, using Moodle. Yeah, and, and, and 
I remember, as I mentioned before, since the beginning of coronavirus, I think this model was trendy because that time I was in Muscat and the, like I can say 90% of the focus of the management uh, of the college was on Moodle. So we needed to upload some material on Moodle, doing some midterm exam, final exam. So what's the idea? Do, don't we have any other type of application that we can use? Um, well, this is one that we had available in the, the college anyway. I mean, I, so I also joined in 2016, but I wasn't here in Chinas. I was in Ibri for... Um, almost three years there before I transferred here. Mm -hmm. And um, we were also using Moodle there. And it was used primarily as um, a repository for resources that were used in the classroom that could then be shared with students perhaps if they were absent. So teachers could upload PowerPoints that they'd used or Word files that they printed out. Um, and so that's how it kind of um, started off with us. Um, and the reason that we, I think, continue to use it is because we've we've established the use of it as a culture within the, the colleges so people know how to use it, they're familiar with it. There are others available, but, you know, Google uh, Blackboard for example um, is one that I think a lot of institutions use. But we've gone with Moodle because um, I, I think it has some advantages, it's open source so you can create, um, we could create in theory plugins for ourselves um, or we can, um, you know, make it suit our own um, needs a little bit better, I think. I'm, I'm not an expert in Blackboard, so possibly some of those things are available as an option there. But I think, you know, the main reason is because we've been using it for a while. I think Blackboard is also very um, useful and convenient, but this is the option that we had. So, mm -hmm. as you said, we started using it, so we were familiar with it. And, uh, yeah. yeah. And also it's very customizable compared to other platforms which are, like, maybe ready-made or something. Mm -hmm. I, I was I have the experience of using Blackboard, but not a way of teaching, but just for uh, marking the assignment of the students, checking the checking the integrity. Mm -hmm. okay. So now let's. So you talk about one of the advantages of uh, Moodle as an open source, but let's consider that if we design most of the most of our placement tests, as I told you, especially during the Corona, we designed some exams, midterm exam, final exam during the uh, coronavirus. Uh, through Moodle. Now let's go back to the integrity. I feel that most of the students were placed that time in many universities and, uh, and institutions wrongly because of using Moodle and then we, we lost the integrity. We didn't know who take the exam actually we do because we were not allowed to ask or urge students to open their, ca their cameras in the beginning of the online education because of some cultural restrictions or their family problems. So don't you think that it can be a biggest uh, disadvantage of using or implementing e-learning? Um, I think, well for example here, it, it depends on the university's policy. Yep. Students had their cameras open during exams and we also had a lockdown browser that prevented students from um, using the laptop in certain ways that could compromise academic integrity. Um, you know, those things are still developing technologies, so if I wanted to get around those systems, I could think of ways, potentially. Um, you know, it's the, the adage uh, yeah. said to catch a criminal, you have to think like a criminal. So if I were to try and imagine ways of getting around those things, I could figure them out. But in a similar way, if I wanted to try and cheat in face-to-face -face exams, there are ways that I could attempt to do it, I think. So, yep. you know, if someone is determined to cheat, I think that they could figure out a way of trying, but it's always going to be a gamble. With this lockdown browser, one of my friends shared a, an experience. He said they just tried uh, simply to connect the laptop to their TV at home. So because the voice is not important, you need the, the student need only to look at the, the screen, right? Yes. And then, so he said, we, we connected or somebody connected the the computer to the TV and then the, the questions were there somebody shout the answers to the guy the guy was actually looking at the camera and trying to talk the answers so I mean they know how to actually <laughs> have to do if, if you're correct if they yeah. want really to cheat doesn't matter you implement lockdown yeah. browser or any type of technology they will do their job yeah I mean uh, it's like Pete said at the beginning that it's a it's a developing technology and it's um, you know, even in, in actual classrooms, students cheated uh, in different various ways. Like, uh, for example, I remember when I was young, when first uh, uh, earphones were a thing, uh, 
some students used it. Uh, um, so they used like a, a phone or a dictaphone or maybe yeah. just a, a play, uh, like a cassette recorder. And they uh, uh, used the, the, the wires of the of the head. They, they hid them like they hid them in their uh, dishdashers and maybe musas, and then used their earphones. So they cheated anyway, because it was not expected. I could imagine that would be very easy to do with a hijab, right? Yeah, yeah, because yeah. Much uh, ex- to exactly. Yes. So, I, yeah. I had this problem. I was working in Iran that time. I was in Vigilator, so I have noticed that. Uh, one of the girls is using these earphones, but unfortunately, uh, well, we are not allowed to to go there and touch the. So yeah. either we need to call an, a woman in vigilator, or if there is no woman available there, then that will be a big issue. So let them, the student do yeah. the job. Yes, yeah, students will find a way to cheat anyway, and they will update their knowledge about yeah, cheating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. um, when we first. Um, uh, we were aware of this at the beginning, so we uh, looked for a solution and then uh, uh, we uh, used first uh, Moodle proctoring. Moodle proctoring uses the laptop camera to uh, take a picture of the exam taker. So the purpose for this was that the student themselves um, take the exam, not somebody else. Mm-hmm. And this was a way to, uh, to find out or uh, to control it a, a bit. And then we uh, uh, had the, we used the lockdown browser, which uh, helped more because the students couldn't get out of the of the page of the exam, but still students could have like for example a paper on their laps, or maybe they could have someone uh, behind the computer showing them the answers or shouting them. That was something that we couldn't control, but. Uh, we always uh, try to uh, come up with solutions, and students will always try to come up with ways to cheat. And well, I think it's you know the same as necessity is the mother of invention, isn't it? Yes. Um, that was the problem with the pandemic is that there wasn't a viable alternative. Yes. So we had to do the best with what we had, and I think that's the, the case globally in most institutions who yes. hadn't already moved towards um, a form of digital learning. Um, we had to then suddenly make a leap. Um, which obviously came with complications, but I think you know, yes. it was um, it was a very steep learning curve, but it was an interesting time. Yeah, to be I mean, involved. students uh, in um, classrooms in exams they are still using paper slips to cheat. So uh, mm-hmm. you always have to remember the smart watches yeah. as well. And yeah. have you seen? Um, I've seen online um, like where students have gone to the trouble of printing off a, not to give people ideas if they're listening by the way, <laughs> but um, to print off a label for a water bottle and attach it. And this works, for example, with oh. like physics formulas. Okay. So where you've got like the calorific information or like the, the manufacturing information that they would have okay. printed very t- tinyly, you know. Um, that, uh, that type of advanced cheating. You yeah. are, yeah. I'm, try, I'm just. I have concern regarding the smart watches, so I ask mm-hmm. also students to remove the smart watches. During the pandemic, I've been well. When um, we've had students in for face-to-face exams, I've been joking with them at the beginning. So I've been saying, you know, do you have a smartwatch? Um, have anyone got any bits of paper? Like, if you've got the answers written inside your mask, <laughs> and, <laughs> yes. and like that, that yeah. one always does get a chuckle. Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> so maybe they hadn't thought of it. Yes, so you give them, <laughs> you give them actually the hint. Right, that's good. Wait, there is a very important statement here, I find it. It's about the assessment with, um, uh, let's say, e-learning or online platforms. Mm-hmm. The assessments that are computer marked generally have a tendency of being only knowledge-based and not necessarily the practicality-based. Can you give an example? Well, I think mostly it talks about um, the, the, the exams or the assessments that we are giving to the students and then if, if they know actually the answer of the question, they can reply, they can answer the, the questions. But if we want them to use in the, let's say, real life situations, then they may not uh, be able to do that one because they just get it for the purpose of passing the exam through online platform. Not any practice outside. I think that this this statement is talking about that one. Uh, but I think this is true to all exams. I think, mm. yeah. yeah. I mean, so, well, if you take the example of a writing exam, students can write an essay. So um, they're not going to know what the question is beforehand. They yeah. might have been, uh, well, hopefully they've been um, guided as to what style, what format they're going to need to produce. Um, 
but they're still going to need to um, respond to the question in a meaningful way using their own information. So I think that it depends, but this, this is the same as on paper is done at the moment. Um, I think one of the things for e-learning is that it, it's got a great deal of potential because it's such a wide area. Mm -hmm. um, so when we're talking about e-learning, um, we're, we're talking about things like Moodle, but we're also potentially talking about things like virtual reality for the possibility of um, you know, having face-to-face -face conversations across the globe in a, yes. sort of a metaverse type environment, yes. which has, you know, if we're arguing, which I think we frequently do, that students in ESL, EFL classes don't have a great deal of exposure to spoken English outside of the classroom. This is one opportunity if we have language labs where students have access to VR, where they can connect with people yeah. all over the world. I think uh, the main problem for online assessment is that when we started uh, teaching online, um, we used the same exams or the same ways that we had before. Uh, the same course that we had, the same course, the same assessment, the same exams. We just tried our best to convert them into uh, online uh, platforms. But the problem is that uh, if you are uh, having, if you are, for example, given an online test, it shouldn't be the same as the one, the paper-based one. Mm. For example, a speaking test shouldn't be like an interview. Maybe it could be um, an, an, an a virtual interview, for example. Uh, or, for example, a writing test shouldn't be, uh, for example, typing the answer from just one question. Maybe it needs to be something else. I don't know. But um, I mean, what we uh, the the main challenge was that we were trying to use the same exams as we had before uh, on online platforms, which uh, of course wouldn't work because it was not tailored. Uh, towards the online uh, learning uh, environment. Uh, see, for example, uh, there are so many universities uh, who teach uh, online courses, even masters and PhDs, but uh, the way they do the, the assessment is different. So they have, for example, open book exams, and they have different ways of testing the knowledge or rather the uh, skills of the student. But uh, we were trying because it was very. It happened very fast, and it was very. We were like we had very short time. Mm -hmm. uh, this was the only way it could be done. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. So, and now, in in your idea, do you think we still need to? Because now we turn to be face to face now these days. Do you think do we need to still keep them as a type of supplementary? application facilitator of education or we need to get rid of them completely? E-learning. I mean, the Moodle specifically. No, I think 100% we need to persist in this because, um, you know, we're living in an increasingly digitized world. I agree. Yeah. Um, and I think that part of it is promoting digital, uh, digital literacy amongst our students. Yes. So this, that needs to be encouraged because it's something they're going to need to interact with um, once they graduate from the foundation program once they graduate from the university. So it's something that we need to be encouraging. And I think also, as we've addressed in previous podcasts that I've, I've been on, um, there are so many advantages that e-learning can offer. And I think that a large part of it is persuading students, convincing students that these genuinely are advantages that they can make use of. So as we discussed before, one of the things is um, the idea of ubiquitous learning, so they can learn any time, any place. Yes. And that's a huge difference from the traditional paradigm of having two hours yeah. in a class and the rest of the time is with your book. Yeah. You know, you can interact with other people um, across the globe or in like your class from your phone. That's incredible. Yes, yes. And I also I think we can use uh, these technologies in, in, during the classroom because, uh, you know, the students are now using uh, they have mobile phones for everything, everything is interactive, everything looks different and then they go to the classroom and they, the teacher is talking the whole, uh, like speaking for the whole time and then they lose interest because uh, we are now teachers are like in a very fast race with other technologies so if we, if we make our, our class, we need to make our class inter more and more interactive every time because students are like uh, using these technologies and uh, for example um, um, my nephew has been uh, before. I mean, in kindergarten before he was, he has been using a tablet for the whole for his learning. He learns using a tablet, and then he when he moved to school, all paper and um, physical interaction. 
and it was very difficult to make him shift to that shift his mind to the physical content because it's uh, it's just the way this generation now is 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 in, is um, going so i think it's the same with our students if they are for example using their mobile phones and if they are entertained for the whole time they're going to lose interest in the classroom so if we don't uh, adapt uh, yeah i agree i think it's like a kind of a competitive economy for attention yes like with, you know, we are up against you know we find the students are trying to use their phones in mm -hmm. class if we are not engaging them yeah um in something that is you know that they're super into um, so you know, occasionally you'll see a student trying to slyly look look at their Instagram or something like that. Yeah. Um, and so I think that we do need to borrow techniques from from social media, from computer games, from yeah. things that the students are into to try and um, make those that are perhaps less motivated more engaged in the classroom. Those who are no good um, with intrinsic motivation are already engaged. They get it. They they know the deal. They play the game. Um, but for those who haven't quite understood it yet because they don't have that yeah. level of awareness. I think using, for want of a better word, the trickery of you know, grabbing their attention in another yeah. way is useful for kingdom. Uh, and I think you can't uh, battle social media and mobile right, phones. Right. It's, That's a good point. Yeah, it's a, it's a loose, loose, loose game. Also, I mean, uh, most of the time, as, as you know, most of the time I'm trying to search the database of uh, teachers in other universities around the world to check what's their work, what's their focus area, their interest. So still the area of uh, digital learning, video games, specifically video game and language learning is still really trendy. Yes. I mean, they are trying to find ways to engage the students in English language learning and teaching while they are playing. And I think that's a very nice one. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's because computer games are fantastic. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, I know because recently you, uh, you started. Yeah, I'm playing, I mean... Uh, we started, yeah. Call of Duty Mobile. Uh, oh, really? Okay. Yeah, that's, yeah. yeah. So, I have a high level. So, I mean, I, I know that it really works. Plus, uh, while I was uh, playing, uh, I'm playing actually the game. They are using some English terms, some new vocabulary, right? Yeah. Yeah. This is and then, yeah. yes, and then I know some Iranian uh, players that they already try to imitate the word with the correct pronunciation. So when you're talking about the enemy is approaching, they really know what's the meaning of enemy is approaching because they can see that the enemy is really in the game, the, 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 the competitors are approaching. So I think that would be a very nice way of uh, I think there are so many uh, young Omanis who will uh, uh, re, uh, like uh, say that chain of command in English, but not in Arabic yeah. because of the computer games. Yeah. Yeah. With the social media, also, what I have one of my friends, Omani, and then he's working on his PhD now, and the focus is on using Instagram and teaching vocabulary, which I think is a really nice one. If we can design, I believe, some pages or. Uh, even if we design applications, mobile -like applications, I think we can be more successful than the traditional way of teaching vocabulary, perhaps presenting inside of the class and yeah. let them see them to repeat because they use their mobile phone, they have their time, yeah. plus they can use it for the learning. I've seen some research that talks about using VR in uh, language learning. And it's Peter's favorite topic, topic actually. Wow. Is it? Because <laughs> Abdullah and I actually discussed this a yes. long time ago. Yeah. Um, and it's something that we, we found sort of very interesting. Um, yeah. So yeah, go on, you were saying. Yeah, so there are some, uh, some applications that were established to use uh, VR and uh, students would wear their VR sets and uh, move around a room, for example, or a museum and as you said learning some vocabulary some words and uh, it's a it's a very um, interesting topic and also it's a very new topic as well it's a it's a like a, to use vr to teach students you will need um, hardware and software and yeah. a lot of stuff but it's very very cool yeah i think there's so much potential for it. i mean obviously the financial aspect is a limiting factor yes um, and then you know, geographically, I suppose, if you don't, if you're not in an area that has, you know, super fast internet, then that's going to be yes, easy to yes. But um, yeah, something I would love to see from that type of thing is a, a narrative that students can explore. 
So not just one where they're interacting with... I mean, the museum thing is, is very cool. Yeah. But I think if you could go on shared missions or quests with people... So there is a, you know, there's that kind of um, communication gap where you are problem-solving with your classmates to try and achieve a common goal. And in the process, language is kind of almost getting Trojan horsed in. Mm, you know? yeah. Like this is, because personally this is one of the ways that I learn, is I learn when I'm really enjoying something. So problem yep. solving or comedy. Um, when I'm watching a comedy show that is educational, then for me that's something where that really sticks, that it, it kind of goes into long-term memory much faster than other things because of uh, the novelty. And I remember reading um, a book by Darren Brown and he, the, he's a sort of a stage magician, a mentalist, uh, you know, hip, hip noted, uh, hypnotist, that's the word I was looking for. And um, yeah, he was suggesting that um, we form memories much better as a species, uh, as individuals within a species, and our, all of us do to some degree with um, emotions that are stronger attached to them. So if something is funny, if something is scary, if something brings you a great level of joy, then that will stick in your mind much more concretely and be a more a more of a long-term memory than if um, you know something that's relatively mediocre. And that is the case for me. And I think that's one of the arguments for making language learning fun, um, and also for the gamification side, is because I think to me that makes sense that it will help students really kind of take it in properly, and VR will be a wonderful platform for that. Yeah. Do, do you think we have the capacity here to implement this VR and language learning? Uh, <laughs> we are still trying to get uh, headsets for our English lab. <laughs> yes. It's, uh, uh, there is a TRC um, application they open every year by December that they, you can apply for this 20,000 real fund. Yes, yes. Okay. They are looking for like innovative ideas. Do you think if, if you write a research project about this VR, I think you have chance to to get that twenty thousand. But do you think is that enough to implement? Uh, the thing is that uh, the twenty thousand is for uh, for the re uh, rec what is it called GR graduate? No, no, that's for research grant. So, so we, we have we have GR which is like three thousand graduate, which is just three thousand that we we already yeah, applied. But, uh, in the same I only month. qualify for that because I have a master's degree. I think the other one requires uh, the yeah, PhD. PhD I think. Yeah, it requires yeah, right. uh, two PhD holders. Oh right. Yes. Okay. So uh, three thousand. Also, the uh, I believe that the funds goes um, go towards uh, the research, not towards like what you. Maybe yes. maybe you'll uh, be able to buy some uh, VR sets for the research for data collection, but not for using afterwards. Not to I, I think, think I mean um, yeah. it's, it's just, just a camera. Cam Do we call it camera? camera? The, the one that okay. the, the one. one. It depends on exactly what you're aiming to do because you can have this is something kind of haptic, like the whole kind of haptic kind of setup. So you yeah. can have. Now, I, I played um, some VR in, uh, in Niswa Mall, uh -huh. um, where I was um, an archer shooting orcs <laughs> okay. trying to stall okay. the castle. Oh, and right. I was having none of it, they, they were not getting into the castle. Um, and for that, I had like, um, so I had the headset um, that gave me immersive sounds and obviously the visual side of it. But it all, I also had a couple of handsets as well that allowed me to do like perform various activities, so the shooting, pulling back of the bow, this kind of thing. There are also ones where you have um, like a treadmill on the floor, and then so you can walk and move in that way. So it depends, like mm -hmm. how awesome you want it to be. But well, I, I think so. Uh, so I think. Uh, do we, I think I'm, I'm sure. I think we need to then design a specific program for English language learning. Am I right? Yeah. Or we can we cannot do follow just in the normal. Yeah, yeah. You, you need software, of course. You don't yeah. just put the the headset on your head and then just. It would be a massive project. Yeah. That's something that I think someone, yeah. if someone else could get behind it. And like I say, I'd like. I, I mean, there, there are a number of options. So, but what I really love to see, as I say, is. Um, a storyline, like a narrative, because I think also we learn well through story. If you look at like, the history of all of our cultures, we learn through telling stories to each other. 
um, and you know, we, we narrativize. Mm -hmm. That's even a word, I believe it is. If it's not, I've just made it up. It's perfectly prominent. Yeah. But we, we turn everything into a story. Um, so and it, it, I think this probably stems back to like evolutionary side of things, uh, like giving the, directions. If you look online, there are some applications that were created for research purposes, and uh, you can use them yeah. using VR and, and yeah. learning. But they're very, very basic. They just um, uh, they are there just to show you like the the basics of VR and uh, how you can implement it in learning labs and, and what uh, the research uh, did to uh, provide data collection and stuff. But there are some applications, they are not like very complete, but there are some, uh, I think they'll be, they, they will increase, they will, they will be more by some years in the future. So, uh, except beside the, beside the English language uh, professionals, we need to have some software development specialist perhaps to work one to one together in order to develop the application i think so it will need um, a software and engineers because it requires a lot of the 3d designing and, oh, right. and stuff yeah so it's not it's not going to be designed by english language teachers maybe no, no. the teachers can give ideas but not yeah. the technical side of it i think for it to be properly engaging then they would need to have Social element to it, and yeah. so like sharing uh, like badges, ranking tables, all these kind of you know borrowing ideas that you get from uh, from computer game, but making it educational but in a way that people want to participate. In. I think that's that's the crux of the matter. It's really making it a product that people would want to engage with, so yeah. that the learning takes place not necessarily as the primary reason. Like they're not playing it to learn necessarily. Yeah. They want to play it and then the learning takes place. And I think you can uh, you can uh, teach it li like you would teach uh, listening, like you can do uh, pre-viewing and post-viewing. Like for example, if someone, one student for example has an AVR experience and then they sit together and they discuss about their experience. I think that's how it will, how, uh, how I imagine it will go. Uh, so it's not only the VR experience, it's also talking about it and sharing experience and like that. Is, Is there any university in the world that uh, develops something like that, that? using VR, VR to for the, the purpose of language learning? Of language learning? Um, there is a lot of research going on, but I'm not familiar with if oh, there yeah. is someone using it actually like for learning. All right. Are you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, me too. too. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's why, why I was asking. asking. Well, I, I know that people are doing research about it, but yeah, I'm yeah. not sure if they it's just theoretically they, they follow something or they design some applications and then they implement it and then it's like an experimental study, case study. Yes. I'm not so sure, sure if it's theory or practice. It's very difficult to uh, apply because of the hardware side of it, and it's it's very uh, costly and also yeah, requires a lot yeah. of. Uh, yeah. I mean, if you think Yep. And uh, yeah. so I think it's something that might take off in the future. Yeah. Elon, Elon Musk perhaps can be the, the right guy to design, to design something, something like that. that. Uh, Facebook is more into VR than Tesla, okay. so I think okay. maybe Mark the Capri. Quite possible, yeah. yeah. Because uh, Facebook produced the Oculus, Oculus mm, yeah. uh, headsets. Yeah, so they are more into VR. And yeah, yeah. So that's kind of a social side of yeah. immersive yeah. reality. Yep. So I think that's another area where, as I mentioned before, the students can have great exposure to English and that, that could be where it's like the internet. As I said, one of the advantages is we're not bound so much by time and space. Yeah. And I mean, even if we think that uh, it's very difficult to apply at the moment, I think uh, it's coming anyway. Students are going like maybe, maybe ten years later, students will be using VR at homes, and maybe they'll have uh, everyone will have a VR. Maybe like they have uh, uh, smartphones now. Uh, so it's only uh, a, a short period of time until everybody has got one. And I think it's uh, going to be very useful if we start early. Uh, thinking about uh, using VR in English classrooms. That's so right. It's yes. going to also raise some problems, which I think is quite interesting too, because you know, if we at the moment find that the classroom management has changed because of smartphones, how 
the classroom management can change if, uh, if we say it's a VR headset that they you know put on, take off. But do you think that's the way it will go, or do you think it will go more along the lines of like the Google Glass type thing, or even something that is less visible? So um, we might not know when they are. It, it, paying it, it depends on how much control students have. So if they have full control, they might be watching a film or doing something maybe engaged in a different uh, virtual reality metaverse and they'd be like roaming around <laughs> yeah. somewhere else. Supposed to be in class and they're all shitty orcs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 So yeah. Everything yeah. comes with its uh, limitations and its... That's uh, true, yeah. Uh, has okay, the, okay, okay, thank, thank you, you so much, Peter, for, for today. today. Thank, thank you, uh, Abdullah. Abdullah. Thank you very much Glad to for this um, discussion. It's not really fruitful. And I got a lot of information, perhaps. And we, we discussed a lot of new ideas about English language learning. I would like to see you more, uh, actually, in the podcast. I have Peter regularly, and people are happy. And then surely they are happy. And then I, I, I hope to have you more and we discuss lots of things like we can maybe one session discuss the my ELT thing so that will be also a good idea I think that's part of the e-learning right okay. so do you, what is your uh, final suggestion final advice for the managers for the authorities in, in order to implement the e-learning in the, in the university well I think um, as uh, we discussed earlier that uh, e-learning is uh, is a huge uh, thing now in uh, not e-learning in, in uh, specific but generally students are using mobile phones they're using technology they're using a lot of stuff outside of the classroom so it's uh, it's uh, very meaningful to bring them in, in into the classroom because uh, uh, they are going to be I, I mean I think they are going to be the future anyway so even if we refuse to uh, to implement them in the fl in the classroom, or maybe like hesitate or re uh, be reluctant towards using technology in the classroom, I think that it's going to be the only way, or one of the only ways to engage students. All right, thank, thank you, you. Peter. Peter? Um, yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I think that um, we already like, in the past we used various different technologies in the classroom. This is just a, a, a slight change, and with that. You know, I, I, I appreciate that some people find it um, challenging, especially if they were born in an era where they didn't grow up with um, some of these technologies that can be quite daunting. But I mean, I think the way to, to get to grips with it is just to spend time with them, uh, experiment with them, play with them, try and enjoy it, find it fascinating. I mean, for me, a lot of all of this e-learning stuff, again, it's just another facet of problem solving, which I really enjoy. Um, so just getting to grips with new technologies is experimental, it's explorative, and for me that's a, a positive thing, so, you know, get in there and enjoy it. All right, thank, thank you so much, thank, thank you, I appreciate your time and effort, and, and uh, wish you the best, best. Thank you. in the future, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.